and high five the best dressed person beside you this morning and say, welcome to church, welcome to church. Tell your second choice, look at them and say, you can do better next week. You can do better. Yeah, today is going to be a good day as we launch into our new series simply called Miracles. And we'll be on a spiritual journey over the next several weeks leading up to Easter to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the greatest miracle that has, that has ever happened. And so our hopes is that it will build your faith, it would inspire you, it would encourage you as we go along this journey and we look into the life, into the ministry of Jesus, and we can pull out some of the lessons that are packed into these moments so that we can apply them to our lives. Come on and be more like Jesus, be more Christ-like. And so if you're willing to go on that journey with me, shout amen. amen. Wow, there's a lot more in second service than first service. First service, five people wanted to go with me because they weren't quite awake yet, but you are awake, alert, and ready to receive. So we'll be in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. We're going to look at the very first miracle that Jesus performed. And it's the law of first, like first principles. And so when you're ready and it's on the screen, say, go with it, Pastor. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine... The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, and that's all we heard from Jesus. That's the last thing Jesus said. <laughs> Come on, guys, we don't talk to our mom that way, right? No, Jesus was not being disrespectful or dishonoring. It's just the way that it, it translated. But he replied, he said, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? I mean, that was like gangster right there. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servant, whatever he says to you, do it. Man, that's a good place for amen. Because I would say that to you as your pastor and as your friend. Like whatever Jesus tells you to do, just, just do it. Now, there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made in the wine and didn't know where it came from, he went, "Woo! that's some good stuff. <laughs> but the servants who had drawn out the water, they knew where it came from. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests are well drunk, then the natural light comes out. The natties, they come out. <laughs> they ain't going to know the difference. But, oh, Jesus, he says, You have kept the good wine until now. And this is the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Come on, look at your neighbor this morning and ask them, are you ready for the unexpected miracle? Are you ready for the unexpected miracle? Shout amen if we can talk about it. Amen. Yeah, yeah, this uh, particular moment in the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus to get things kicked off this first miraculous moment is unlike the other moments. I understand, you know, the miraculous moments when it comes to blind Barnabas. How many of you know Jesus healed the sick? He, he, he healed blind eyes. He cleansed lepers. He, he met needs like, I, I, get, I get all that. I get healing blind Barnabas. I get it. I get healing uh, Jairus's daughter. I completely understand the woman with the issue of blood. Like, these are important moments. These are moments that, man, really, really, really seem to matter, like to maximize the moment. Like, Jesus feeding 5,000 plus. I, I understand that. Lazarus being raised from the dead. I, I get that. But the first, the first miracle that Jesus did was to take, like, Zephyr Hill and turn it into Zivendell. 
I watched enough Sesame Street in my young, like as a kid, to know like one of these things don't belong. One of these things are not like the other. Almost seems like a cool, a cool party trick. Like, really? You're going to start your ministry out turning water into wine. But it makes sense when you look at the big picture because this all started, Genesis chapter 1, there was a wedding somewhere between Adam and, and Eve. And we can fast forward all the way to the back of the book in Revelation that there is a wedding between the church and, and, or, and Jesus, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so it makes sense. It makes sense that Jesus would step into this moment and his glory would be manifested and that he would, he would take water and turn it into wine whenever you look at the big picture. But you would have thought, like, with Jesus' attitude, he's like, man, my hour has not come yet. Like, this, I, I really don't, like, this really don't matter to me. <laughs> to me. I mean, you got to understand, a, a, a Jewish wedding, a Jewish, like, process this would have been like for day like days it ain't like we do it for a couple hours i'm talking about a wedding a jewish wedding lasted days and so at this point it almost you can almost feel the the aggravation or the 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 tension that jesus has concerning this because you gotta you gotta set the scene because aunt nancy's probably doing karaoke drunk with the mic at this point I'm telling you, it's getting wild at this point. They've already drank all that they had. And I guarantee you, they had a lot. And so Mary sees a problem, sees an issue, sees a struggle. And Mary goes to Jesus about the problem. You know where she didn't go? She don't go where we usually go. We try to involve everybody in our, like all the people at the wedding and, and get them involved in the problem. You notice Mary didn't go to all the other people in the wedding about the problem. Mary went to Jesus about the problem. Let me ask this question. Where do you go when problems show up in your life? Where do you go where adversity and challenges and struggles and issues? Usually, Jesus is not the first choice, but the last resort. Like when everything else hadn't worked, we go to Jesus. We start to pray. We start to believe. But we want to run to everyone in the party that can't do nothing about your problem. But Mary, because she had a relationship with Jesus, knew exactly where the answer was. Even, let me just say this. God has already solved. He's already, he's already got an answer to the problem. that ain't even showed up in your life yet. And a lot of us spend a lot of time, effort, and energy involving people into our problems that can do nothing about our problems. And Jesus is usually not our first choice but our last resort. But Mary, because of her relationship with Christ, like he, she knew that Jesus was more than just a carpenter, that he was the Christ. And that she went to Jesus about the problem because she knew exactly where the answer and the solution would come from. He's more, he's more, he's more than just a carpenter. He's the Christ. He, he's, he's, he's more, he's the the solution, and too many of us, listen to me, we involve people in our problems that can do nothing about our problems. And Mary didn't run to the wedding party, and everyone in it said, oh, we had a wine, we had a wine, we had a, what are we going to do? What are, went right to Jesus. Where do you go when problems arise? Is prayer and Christ your first choice or your last resort? Because too many of us, we, 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 we want to involve people before we involve the presence of God. Now, on the surface, like, this really didn't matter to Jesus like it mat mattered to Mary. Like, Mary's like, they had a wine. He's like, woman, what does that have to do with me? I like it. It's so gangster. It's so, so you got to read the Bible like that. I mean, I, I would never respond to my wife or my mom like that, but Jesus, he's God. He can respond whatever way that he wants to. He's like, man, my hour has not yet come. This don't have nothing to do with me. And, and I love the fact that although this didn't matter, to Jesus like it mattered to Mary because of the relationship 
Mary mattered to Jesus. Come on, so it mattered, mattered to Jesus. And I love the fact that God is willing to step into some what seems to be insignificant areas of our life, not because we see it like Jesus, but because Jesus sees us. Come on, somebody. Like it didn't, it didn't matter to him, but Mary mattered to him. And because Mary mattered to him, then it, he put himself in a position. He put his, like, it was almost like he, mama, mama, like pushed him into a little, like pushed him into the purpose, right? Sometimes we need just a little bit, a little bit of push. But I love the fact that although it didn't, running out of wine didn't matter to Jesus the way it mattered to Mary, but because Mary mattered to Jesus, Jesus was willing to step into some of these areas. And because you matter to Jesus, maybe there's a situation or there's a circumstance or there's a struggle or there's a challenge. Like maybe you see it a certain way and God sees it a different way. But because he sees you and because you matter, he's willing to step in because it matters because you matter. And if it matters to you, come on, it matters to him because you matter. Tell your neighbor, you matter. You matter. Yeah, you matter. You do. You, you matter. Even though Jesus' attitude wasn't really conducive, like you could feel the tension. It didn't, it didn't, really, didn't really matter to Jesus the way it mattered to Mary. Too many of us trying to get people to solve our problems that they can't do nothing about it. And so in this area of unexpected miracles we're going to see a few things that took place within the text of scripture that if we apply to our life we open up and position ourselves to experience these unex like these unexpected miraculous moments because i didn't like the, the furthest thing like to start a ministry off like this is kind of unexpected it almost seems unexpected to jesus and the first thing that that we see is in verse 2 that Jesus and his disciples were invited. They were invited to the, to the wedding. And so if you're going to experience the unexpected miracles in our life, you've got to invite Jesus in to certain areas. It's amazing how we want God to actively work in areas of our life that we don't give access to those areas of life. Come on, somebody. And so Jesus was invited. The disciples were invited into the wedding. And there's a lot of areas of our life that we do not invite Jesus into. You can be my Sunday God, but my Saturday night God, woo, don't, no, don't, you, don't you be coming around. Jesus is more than just a Sunday God. And I say it like this. God, like, God's enough, but Sundays is not. If the only word and the only worship is what you're getting in this moment, you are missing out on a journey of faith and, and the relationship, the relational reality that God desires to have with you. Do you invite him? Like, and we'll invite him into our salvation because nobody in their right mind wants to go to hell. But will you invite him into your finances? <laughs> Thank you for that thunderous silence. Will you invite him into your marriage? Will you invite him into your dating? Will you invite him into your, your career? And it's amazing that we expect God to actively work in areas that we don't give him access to. And Mary, Mary invited, he was invited into the wedding. What areas are you not inviting Jesus into? It's almost like, like when Jesus was 12 and Mary and Joseph left him in the temple. Yeah. Not very good parenting advice. I mean, they walked for days not realizing. Nobody asked the question, where's Jesus? Well, Jesus was in the temple all about his father's business. And a lot of us will, will so to speak, hypothetically leave Jesus right here and when you walk out them doors. And Jesus was never designed to be just your Sunday God, but your Monday God, your Tuesday God, your Wednesday God. And let me just say this. I used, like, I get it. I get it. We're all in a process of sanctification, but there was a, a time that, yeah, Jesus, you ain't coming with me Saturday night. I guarantee you, you ain't coming. I'll see you Sunday morning at church, and then I'll come back and see you <laughs> next Sunday. And many of us, we don't experience unexpected 
miraculous moments because we don't give Jesus the access in those areas in our life. We like taking Jesus to the, like, to the wedding. We like, because the wedding, you know, the wedding's nice. It's pretty. Everybody's dressed good. They're on their best behavior. You got the flower girl that's throwing the little flowers, and, and it's like, dun, dun, the bride's coming out. Everything looks good. The pastor's up there. He's giving the vows and all that stuff. You, you know what's kind of messy and what's kind of uncomfortable? It's the reception. Jesus, you can come you can come to, to my, wet, my wedding, but you, you can't come to the reception because, because you, know, you know y'all be you're getting crazy with that Cupid shuffle thing, man. Y'all be, you be like to the right, then you back to the left. And now you kick, and you kick Jesus out of things you should be inviting him into. Because this is what I know, because of the relationship I have with Jesus, the relationship that Mary had with Jesus, it don't matter. I'm bringing Jesus with me. I'm inviting him into every area of my life. I am not doing the Cupid Shuffle without Jesus. I'm not even going to Walmart or Publix without Jesus. If I go to the right, he's coming to the right, to the right, and to the left, and to the left. And when I kick, I need him to kick. I ain't kicking him out of anything because I need Jesus in everything. And too many of us, we kick Jesus out of areas we need to invite him into. Why? Because we don't know him. You don't know him the way I know. You don't know him the way Mary knows. You don't know him. Because if you knew him, you'd invite him in. It's through that relationship. And too many of us, listen to me, we don't experience God's best. We don't experience the miraculous working things, the unexpected things, because anything is possible when Jesus is invited into it. And, and it didn't, like, let me just say this. The Cupid shuffle does not matter to Jesus, but you matter to Jesus. And because you matter to Jesus, he wants to be in every area of your life, whether it's to the right, to the left. Now kick. Too many of us. We leave Jesus at church, like Sunday. We, we don't invite him into those areas. You don't experience God's best. He was invited to the wedding. And I love Mary's response. Mary's like, they, they, have, they, have, they have no wine. He's like, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet, yet come. And she just ignored, it, just ignored that. She's like, I already know that you're the solution. I already know that you're the answer. I know that you've, you, like you've, you're the great I am. I know you're the voice that was crawling out from the burning bush in the, in the wilderness. You are the great I am. I know that you'll be what we need to, you to be when you need to be it. I know that, that you, you'll, be, you'll be my protection because you're, you're a protector. You'll be my peace in the middle of a storm. Like, I know that you'll be, you'll be my provision and you'll be my, my, my promise. Like, he is the great I am. He is the God. He is what we need when we need it. Mary knows that he's the vine and the wine and the one that steps outside of time. He's the one that can make this boy rhyme and do it all the same time. He's that guy. He's like, nah, 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 nah. I don't care what you say. I know. I know. You're, you're, you're the vine. You're the wine. You're going to do it this time. It ain't going to cost me a dime. And some country boy is going to be able to rhyme about this at some time. I know. Do whatever you ask. Why? Because she had an expectation that when Jesus steps into a situation, no matter how insignificant it may seem to others, it's going to matter to him because you matter. And we invite Jesus into it and he becomes the solution. He's been the solution to, to humanity's problem since the beginning. Before the foundations of the world, Christ was crucified. Before you ever sinned, there was, oh, come on somebody, there, there was grace that was being prepared for the problem. Come on. And a lot of us, because life and because trauma and because of pain and because of setbacks and set downs and letdowns and things that happen, people do you wrong. Our expectation of anything good happening has been, has been destroyed or minimized because this is a broken world. 
I don't date the way I used to because someone broke, like it's, it's broken. I don't expect good things. I don't expect opportunities. I don't expect. And Mary's expectations of Jesus being the solution to her problem didn't detour what he said. That whole woman, my hour had not yet come yet. She's like, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to go to the servants and say, whatever he asks you to do, you do it. Because my expectations are so high. I've seen him. I know him. I know who he is. He ain't just the carpenter. He's the Christ. He is the solution to every humanity's problem. Whatever he does. And a lot of us, the enemy has stolen our expectations. We don't expect anything good. And if we do and it shows up, we look, we're looking for that moment for it to go away. And so what the enemy has gotten us to do is to settle, to settle for a wedding with no wine, to settle for a marriage with no love, to settle for a life with no joy, no peace, and no passion. Why? Because we've been wounded and traumatized by a sin-filled world, a broken world with broken people who have let you down. Maybe it's the choices that you've made. Maybe it's the circumstances that have arrived. Maybe it's the choices that somebody else made. We all have tattered and broken areas of our life. And if we're not careful, we'll have our expectations so low that we won't believe that God can give us his best in any situation. And we settle for weddings with no wine, life with no passion, no purpose, marriages that are joyless because we don't expect God's best because we live out of a wound, a hurt, a broken place. And we don't invite God in to those areas. I am running out of time, but keep looking forward and act like we have plenty of time, people. ignore that clock the second thing to experience in the unexpected miracles in our life is the involvement you've got the invitation but you also there's this this involvement and you know I, I love the fact that Mary involved herself in a matter that didn't directly impact her and how often do we come to God, petition God, pray when we run out of wine? It's real easy when we've run out of some stuff to go and seek God. When's the last time that you prayed and you went to, to God on behalf of someone else's problem? Mary made the problem matter to her, and she said, you know what? I know the one that can solve it, and I want to be a part of the solution. I want to be a part of the answer. When is the last time that you involved yourself in being the answer to a problem that someone else had? Oftentimes, when we do that, we set ourselves up to be able to experience an unexpected, miraculous moment that Jesus wants to do great and mighty things in our life, but we can be so self-consumed with our life, our wants, our, our, our needs, that we, we forget that somebody else's wine has ran out, and as long as my wine's good, I'm okay. When has the last time have you stepped into someone else's life and helped them be like, help Help be a part of the solution and the answer that Jesus is wanting to demonstrate and display in someone else's life. Because we can, we can look, as long as my wine, like as long as I'm, I'm okay, it's okay. But Mary refused to say it's okay. She said, you know what? This matters. I'm going to involve myself. I'm going to go ahead and get Jesus. And you know how Jesus solves problems? He solves problems by getting disciples involved in the answer. And as long as disciples just want to just party, like, come on, we can miss some miraculous moments in our life. And maybe you're here today, like, why did they run out of wine? We can carry that attitude. Did they not prepare? Did they not use wisdom? Did they not steward the wine properly? I mean, why? Why did they? Why did they run out of wine? It's not my fault. What if, what if Mary would have said, well, if you would have used wisdom. 
I told, I told you. What, 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 you. You should have been prepared. Oh, no, you should have been prepared. Why did they? I got to ask myself, why did they run out of wine? Why did they run out of wine? Maybe it could be from some in, like, uninvited guest. You know, it's possible to run out of what you could have plenty of when you invite people into areas of your life that shouldn't have access to certain areas of your life. There are some relationships you need to stop at the door because all they, all they bring to the relationship is their cup in a two-step. Their cup in a two. Come on, y'all don't know about that. That's old school. And all they do is draw out. They never pour in. And you'll run out of what you could have plenty of if you had relational intelligence and stop some things at the door instead of allowing them access to dip into areas of your life that they were never, they were never supposed to be dipping into. Some of you, you feel joyless, you feel peaceless, you feel empty. Could it be that there are some uninvited guests that have access to areas of your life that you should have cut off at the door? It don't mean that you don't love them. It just means you don't love them and not love you at the same time. I'm preaching good today. This right here would change your life. I'll save the rest of that for a relationship series in summertime or something. Call it friendology or something. I don't know call it friends. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know. I'd sh- stop it. It's the way it goes in my mind. I don't need <laughs> correcting. You watched enough friends, you would know. Yeah. And so in, in, involvement, Mary, Mary involves herself in someone else's problem, being a part of the solution. Or how, how about this? One of the biggest hurdles to experience in the unexpected, miraculous moments in our life is that we, they, what did they want? They wanted, somebody say wine. They wanted, but Jesus told them to go fill the water, the water pots up with, they wanted, they got one of the biggest challenges in this walk of faith is being able to carry water when what you wanted is wine. Because that water will be talking to you. You know what? I mean, 20 or 30 gallons, the, the, the water pots of the uh, purification uh, ceremonial uh, where they would wash your hand. That, I mean, that's heavy. Water's heavy. It was about eight pounds a gallon. It's heavy. It takes a lot of work. It t- takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of energy. At some point, Jesus is going to, that's why we joined the dream team is because we want to be able to carry and do what we can do so we can experience the only thing that God can do. I can't, I can't turn water into wine, but I can carry water when God says carry water. I can do it. And a lot of us, we miss out on some miraculous moments in our life because we're unwilling to carry the water because what we asked God for was wine. And we don't see the wine right, so we don't carry the water tight and right. And so because we don't carry the water, we don't experience the wine. And we find ourselves complaining, I asked for wine. Why I got to carry this water? Are you willing to carry the water? Are you, are you willing to see the water for what it could be, not for what it is? Because it's real easy. Lord, I asked you, I asked you to, to help me in my marriage. And I've been coming to church for two weeks, and it ain't working. And we set down the water. And the water would be like, it's not working. This ain't even what you asked for. You putting all this effort and energy and time they need wine, and you over here carrying a you carrying water like like a fool. Or we need financial, like we we want God to help us in the area of finances, and God says, "Okay, carry water," and we carry carry it for a short distance, or we carry it for a waste. Well, it's not what I want. It's I need wine. But this is water. And so we quit the water, but we don't realize we're not quitting the water. You are quitting the wine because you can't see it for what it will be. You just see it for what it is. And one of the tensions that faith creates in our life is, are you willing, whatever he says, do it. Are you willing to do what he says in spite of what you see? 
Can you carry water when it's hard? Can you carry water when it's heavy? Can you carry water when it's inconvenient? Can you carry water when it doesn't make sense? Can you carry water when it's messy? Because if you keep carrying it and you keep doing what he told you to do, he'll do what you can't do, but he will not do what you won't do. I'm going to keep carrying the water. I'm going to keep carrying as long as he asks me to do it, because at some point it's going to turn into wine. And so many of us quit on this journey of faith in certain areas of our life because you quit doing what he said because you allow what you see to stop you. And people, people will look at your water. They got something to say about your water. You'll be carrying the water and they ask you, what you doing? I said, I'm getting this wine. I said, water, dog. Nah, it's wine. What you doing? Carrying this wine. Like I'm carrying this wine, it's like that. No, that, that's water. Well, you can see it for what it is today, but God's going to turn it into something miraculous tomorrow or the next day or the next month. Whenever he decides to do it. And when he does, because I'm willing to carry the water, I'm going to be able to experience the good wine, the good stuff, the good things that God pours into people's lives. We're able to see it. You know who had a front row seat to this miraculous moment? The servants. Nobody else knew where it come from. But the servants, because when you get involved in the work that God is doing, that's why we make it super easy. 386-603-9131. Serve. Why? Because we want you to be able to experience what it's like when God turns water into wine. Because you don't see it from there, but you see it when you're willing to carry the work and the load of the ministry. You don't necessarily get to see broken people come out whole. You just see broken people because you... You're invited into something that is superior, that is greater. And some of us can treat this place right here just like a religious ceremony, just like the manner of purification for the Jews just coming. We can, we can, we can treat it just like religious calisthenics, and it will always leave you empty and not filled. Just play in church on Sunday, just a religious calisthenic. You will be empty and you will not be filled. But the same place that was empty and was not filled was the same place that Jesus and the same thing that he used to fill others, to transform others, and to make a difference in the lives of others. It's the same place. It's all in how you approach it and how you see it. Your involvement, it isn't because we don't have nobody to do something. We want God to do a work in your heart. I want people to experience what it's like to see Jesus turn water into wine up front and close and personal because it will change your life. And guess what? The disciples, although they carried water, they could have dipped into it too. Took about. That's why we have the culture of sit one, serve one. You can pour a glass and drink one too. Hypothetically, you can get filled with his spirit, with his goodness, with his love and his mercy. Last thing we're getting out of here and we're going to pray. It's an improper perspective. See, I'm going to tell you the same thing that Mary told the servants. Whatever he says, do it. And some of us, it depends on what he says if he gets our yes. And what I mean by that, if we agree with what he says, then we'll say yes to what, he, to what he's asked us to do. But I don't give God my yes based off of what he said. Come on, that's a very superficial relationship. God gets my yes not because of what he said, but because of who he is. And because I know who he is, he'll always have my yes about anything he asks me to do. Some of you think what he asks you to do is up for debate or it's negotiable because you don't know who he is. If you know who he is, you'll invite him into everything that you have and everything that you own and every like piece and part of your life. If you know the who, the what, it's going to take care of itself. But because we don't, that's why we, we give you an opportunity to know God. Join and jump in a small group. It's called discipleship. My answer to God is yes. To what? Whatever it is. Why? Because I know his character. I know his nature. 
I know who he is. I know his goodness. I know his love. I know his, he wants the best for me. He wants the best for you. There's no one that will shepherd you the way that Jesus will. And so many of us, we just make God our Sunday God, but he wants to be our Saturday night God. He wants to join us, not just in the wedding, but in the reception. And he's got my, he's got my yes. Not because of what he said, but because of who he is. And so maybe you're here today with every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe your yes to God is is concerning salvation. Like you've never said yes. You've never responded to God's goodness. You know, it's the goodness of God that leads one to repentance. It's the fact that I'm up here and I want you to know that God loves you. He's for you. He wants, he wants to do the Cupid Shuffle with you, man. He wants to, wherever you go, he wants to be there relationally. Not just a religious ceremony, but a, re, a relational reality. He's not ashamed of you. Listen to me. He's not ashamed of you. He's not embarrassed of you. And let me just say this. He doesn't love some future better version of you. He loves you and your mess and your flaws and your failures and all your mistakes. There's nothing that you could do or not do to make him love you any less. He loves you with everything that he has. You are the apex of his love. If you're here today and you've never said, you know what, I need you. I need Jesus. On the count of three, with every head bow, every eye closed, I want to I want to pray with you. And so, if that's you, just slip your hand up. One, two. Don't let the enemy steal this moment either. Three. Come on, faith-filled church. Let's put our hands together for Jesus.